Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Hey, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, pleasure to meet you. Hey, uh, my thank you, GES, for conducting this panel discussion. I think this would be a very interesting panel discussion because we are talking about the new technologies and the new esports fun frontiers. And I have very exciting panelists with myself here. So just to start on just uh, uh, with you all, I want to understand like how do you think that data is bringing esports uh, people uh, people closer to esports? Uh, in this uh, era, like uh, uh, you all are uh, dealing with the new technologies and of course you'll be dealing with a lot of data on a day-to-day -day basis. But what are your views that how is data bringing people closer to esports? And and if you can quickly tell us about uh, about your uh, esports, about your uh, company as well. So, yeah, Miguel? Yeah, sure, uh, with pleasure. Uh, it's actually a question that could last uh, for the full hour, so I'll try to uh, I'll try to keep it brief. So yeah. hi everyone, once again, Miguel from 3D Aim Trainer. What we do in a nutshell is we help uh, shooter players across the world to get better at what they love doing, uh, which is gaming. So we have uh, designed and created a platform where they can um, improve their skills and well, get to that pro level uh, as fast as possible. And data, uh, to, um, to link to your question, uh, plays an absolutely crucial role there for us. Um, what we do uh, for our users is, well, we've initially, when creating our product, we've used data to understand how a pro player is different from a typical casual gamer and, and, and a normal player. What data points, what things that we can capture in their gameplay differentiates them from everyone else. And based on that, we've created a comprehensive list of skills, basically, that one should have in order to be able to improve. Because if you don't know what kind of skills you should master, it becomes difficult, of course, to focus and train them. Uh, so that's the first thing where we use data in shaping our product is understanding what it means from a data point of view to actually be a good player. Um, and then the second piece is actually allowing uh, those gamers that want to improve to understand how good they are compared to others, compared to those pros. So we've created training environments where we can capture their data whilst they are playing, whilst they are training. And then we present them this data and we provide them feedback on uh, this data and tell them, hey, th this is where you're already uh, at the great level, this is where you still have room for the most improvement. And then again, based on that data, we give them recommendations on which types of trainings they should be doing in order to improve uh, uh, their aim and try to get to that level. Um, so it, I mean, data is woven in, in our own product, um, but I, I also think it is super important for um, esports teams in general, uh, because of course they also rely on on data in order to measure the capabilities of their players and to be able to well differentiate between um, um, rough diamonds that could be shaped into the next rock stars and and people who are great enjoy playing but simply lack the the pure cognitive skills in order to make it ever to that level. So we see ourselves in that perspective a bit as a gatekeeper in order to tell them like, okay, this is what it takes. This is, these are people that are talented, that are worthwhile to invest in and, and build further on. So we try to create the bridge there uh, and the bridge is actually created by data uh, and we are just a service provider there, I guess. Now, last but not least, I think data also gives lots of opportunities from a, uh, from a fan engagement perspective. Imagine that that your kid is like a soccer fan, which which is very much possible, of course, and he would have a ball at home uh, that he or she could kick, kick and then uh, the ball would tell him or her like um, how hard he is kicking it compared to Ronaldo or Messi or anything like that. I mean, that, that would be like pure gold for this kid, kid. And that's exactly what we offer in esports. I mean, it's a digital sport. Everything is measurable. Everything is comparable. And you simply know how good you are versus those rock stars. So, it, yeah, data is a blessing uh, for the so digital. Very, 
it's a very good uh, feedback mechanism for the gamers who are on your platform and i think data is proving to be a good uh, provides a good feedback for your all your gamers how do you think it is different uh, uh, for anyone else like for maybe anders if you have any thing to share about it like how do you think data is playing differently for your organization yeah so we have uh, a little bit like miguel we have some focus on the professional tier or people trying to make it into that tier um but we also have a, a large exposure to tournament organizers i and the creative director of Skybox, but I also, uh, you know, half the time work as a commentator and a, and a sort of show creator uh, in different parts of esports. So I have a, a pretty big background in that. And one of the things that we're lacking heavily, especially when you compare to how television broadcasting works, is something called you know data-driven narratives or data-driven storylines. Uh, it's super hard to explain to an audience why they should care about a match if they don't have a very good, quick breakdown. It can't be like an hour long documentary every time. Sometimes you just need to know these three players were the best in the last quarter. And when we mean best, we mean best by these metrics, uh, something like that that can be introduced really quickly. It's something you see if you ever watch the UFC or anything like that. They're very good at doing like three minute introductions to people you've never heard of. But because they have some data, they have something to, to structure that by, you can get some really interesting stuff out of that. And we, the reason we want to do that in the broadcasting sphere is that there's this tendency within esports to try and just fight for the same audience all the time. But we think if we can help with the data side, if we can help new people that have never seen esports before get into the space, then we're sort of increasing the size of the pie and then people can always fight over the you know their share of it. But it's just a little bit more interesting that way. Um, and then we have, I mean, the other analysis that we did in our company was that a lot of the resources go into trying to make the top 1% of all of the players and teams better. And that's an admirable goal. And I don't mind if people do that, but we just thought maybe a little bit like Miguel, but we don't have the aim and mechanical, uh, let's say exposure. We just th worry about the strategy and the, let's say like game understanding side of things. Um, but we think if we can help the bottom of the pyramid, fast track them to be competitive and to become professional, again, we end up increasing the size of the pie for everyone. And then the teams and the organizers and everyone else who's interested can fight over who gets the best or the biggest share, where we don't really worry so much about that. We just want to try and see if we can increase the audience size and increase the competitive player base. Basically, um, that's what we're doing. And yeah, data is what we we crunch uh, in Counter Strike at the moment, but uh, looking at a bunch of other games at the same time. Perfect. I think uh, we have a specialist here from uh, on Counter Strike as well, like Daniel, who is also working on the same uh, on something which is for the audience and for the viewers. So Daniel, how do you think uh, data is acting differently for your organization? Uh, well, first and... of all, I wouldn't say I'm an expert like Anders. You know, <laughs> I've, I've listened to Anders casting a lot of esports matches, and uh, there's no way I could compete with him whatsoever uh, on that level of sophisticated knowledge around Counter Strike. But uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, data is the very heart of stream cards, um, and actually, we're also looking at building fan engagement initially for Counter Strike uh, as a uh, Counter Strike Global Offensive as a first title, um, because what stream cards essentially is, it allows viewers to be um, able to to participate in the action directly on the esports broadcast on Twitch. Um, and what it does is it actually enables viewers to compete against each other in real time by making micro predictions relating to the underlying broadcast. So uh, it's essentially a game within a game. Uh, and as bizarre that sounds, it actually works. Um, so for example, if you're watching a CSGO match and you feel like you know the game, the teams, the tactics, the weapons choices, like a back pocket, you'll be able to play cards with conditions such as um, terrorists will get free kills or a bomb will be defused or terrorists will spend a total of let's say 10k during the next buy-in and all of this is possible directly from the level of the twitch broadcast um thanks to the data that we actually get from the game server uh, allowing us to verify whether if burn if the certain events have actually occurred or not so uh yeah it's really interesting to also see what Anders is doing with uh, with uh, with skybox because uh, i think there's a lot of room to develop fan engagement um i think we're just getting started in the in industry uh, with this aspect. Sure, and, and how about you, Lance, uh, who is joining us uh, midnight from LA? So what do you think? <laughs> uh, 
uh, how is data shaping in your organization? And I mean, is it more on the gamers or on the viewers? Like what is the essential role of data which you are using in your company? Well, first and foremost, thank you. And I would like to also say a massive thank you to ISF for having EFUSE here and also staging this hybrid model uh, event, allowing us to share in uh, our experiences at our different organizations and how we hope to grow gaming as a whole together. So just a massive thank you uh, for that opportunity. Um, and then also next, I would like to just give a little rundown of what EFUSE is. EFUSE is a social media company where we connect gamers to meet, compete, and discover new opportunities, really completing the whole ecosystem of what is gaming. Um, with that said, we really listen to the different data points that we have, whether it's API integrations that we have with our publishers to better serve our members and our, our community that we have grown already, um, whether it's working with different influencers in certain game titles or working in women in gaming. Um, these are all initiatives that we look towards data in order to solve a problem. Um, and that's really credit to our CEO, Matthew J. Benson, and our CTO, Patrick Schuff, who have done an amazing job on building a platform that is hyperscalable, but also uh, really now diving into different data points of how we can build products and features and continue to iterate to make sure that we're delivering on what our, what our community needs. And it's not just about what our existing community needs, it's about finding different uh, certain certain issues or certain problems within whether it's the fighting game community or whether it's the sim racing community and seeing how can we develop a solution that will better fit their needs um, that's really what efuse really looks towards um, and being able to identify those and build and strategize products and how we can work with them and collaborate with them we firmly believe that the community is the strongest part of the gaming industry and we want to complete that ecosystem and make sure that we're uniting all in the gaming ecosystem so that we can continue to grow the sport and all of gaming um, in a healthy and professional way. Um, so we work with you know top tier publishers, pro teams and organizations all the way down to the scholastic space where we have a product called Pipeline because we saw a fit um, that in the traditional sport world, um, you have the, the top 100 for uh, the ESPN top 100 for a basketball player or a football player, but that doesn't exist inside of the gaming space right now. Um, so Pipeline, at least at eFuse, is a solution to solve that type of problem um, where we can go and go to a publisher and say, hey, we've developed this. We've gotten great feedback from the over 160 universities that are on our platform, listening to our combines, wanting to recruit players, not only in the United States, but also abroad um, and giving them those opportunities to come and compete uh, for a scholarship or a prize pool or whatever it may be. Um, so data is incredibly important to what we do over at eFuse. Perfect. Thank you, Clans. So uh, going to my next question to the panelists is that, uh, how, do you think that these new technologies are helping esports to become a sport or is it something more than that? And how do you think that in your organization, when you're talking about uh, doing a lot of data mining and doing a lot of research, doing connecting to a lot of gamers, and they're all connecting on esports, but do you think these technologies which are developing is about making esports a full-fledged sport or is it more than that? So, Daniel? Uh, it depends, it really depends um, which side, you know, you're looking at esports. I, I guess, you know, from Mikhail's side, obviously uh, with free to aim train and professionalizing um, the way you can actually uh, adjust your skills um and train uh you know it, it just makes 100 percent sense to look at esports as growing something towards traditional sports because if you can have if you can easily recreate training conditions uh, that you would have for example on a football pitch where you could have a stack of 100 footballs and were taking corner kicks from the set, same spot on a pitch it's good for adjusting and calibrating your sense and judgment however um I feel that from a fan engagement perspective, I think esports is or rather has the potential to be uh, way more than a traditional sport. You know, I, I, I think there is obviously many ways in which you can engage um, thanks to publishers, broadcasters and platforms such as Twitch themselves in, in engaging fans. And this is something that you wouldn't traditionally see in, a, uh, it, it typically see in traditional sports, simply because traditional sports don't offer that level of engagement which platforms can for example provide um between viewers directly having said that you know i'm, I'm going to make a bold statement and say that you know we're just 
at a very early stage of building fan engagement. In the future, I definitely see um, games publishers getting more creative uh, in ways in which uh, you can actually engage as a fan with the outcome of a match. You know, as bizarre as that sounds, uh, you know, I think teams are going to be looking to have audiences, to have fan bases who will be cheering for them during a match. And with those cheers, if they for example, um, donate money during the broadcast or cheer for their team, they'll be able to spawn an item drop for their team. Or if it was a MOBA game, like League of Legends Dota 2, you might have uh, a case where if you have enough fan cheers, you know, a, a creep wave might be completely annihilated. Uh, these things, I know they sound bizarre, but if we look back at the industry, back to I think it was like 2012 where Bessem Adventure Partners were looking to invest in Twitch. Uh, I think they did in the end. Um, interestingly, in their investment memo, which is publicly available, they actually had a scenario analysis um, of how the industry was going to de develop because you know streaming wasn't mainstream back then. It was growing, but it wasn't still mainstream. And one of the risks that they listed in the investment memo in that scenario analysis was that games publishers would be suing Twitch for you know infringing their IP for allowing gamers to stream content, and that was estimated at like 15. percent You know today. That's completely different. Like you actually want, as a games publisher, you want your game to be popular on Twitch because that serves as a great proxy, as a benchmark for how popular your game is going to be and potentially can grow to becoming a fully fledged esports title. Obviously, becoming an esports title carries with it its own requirements, um, but I guess that's beyond the, the point of my of the point I'm trying to raise. The, what I'm trying to say is that this industry is growing rapidly, and you know you're not going to be able to see a fireball suddenly raining down a football pitch during a match between Manchester United and Bayern Munich. That would be crazy, you know, some players getting burned and stuff. But you can have such things happening in virtual worlds, and it's up to the publishers to define these features, develop these features, which can add this additional level of fan engagement where the voice of the fans matters, and that actually unlocks the potential to unlock more monetization opportunities within esports. Sure. So, uh, welcome, uh, Eric. Uh, so, just wanted to check with you on this question. Like, do you think that these new technologies are helping esports become a sport, or do you think it's something more than that? And how are you looking in your organization esports? And uh, and as far as I know, that you have an esports vertical team academy and all those things. So, how are you looking? Uh, that these new technologies can help esports go, going towards a more uh, sport, or is it something more in? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So thank you, uh, and apologize for my internet connection. Got yeah, I got dropped off. Um. So to answer your question, uh, just to give you a little background about Pluck, uh, because it relates to your question. So we started Pluck back in 2017 when Fortnite Battle Royale got started and we started as an event platform. So we did these automated events on uh, for Fortnite uh, where, where gamers could join and, and win money. So the, basically the same model as probably, probably 20 other companies are doing now. So you pay to enter and maybe win. So we call it self betting. And um, we did that for a while, we got good traction because young gamers, you know, first time now they're able to compete. This was before the cash cops uh, they were able to win a lot of V bucks and digital cards. So that was a lot of fun, but we also encountered a lot of problems, uh, especially when you, you know, when you're dealing with young kids playing and when it comes to payments and stuff like that. So um, we did tracking, we did ranking, and then we started talking to organizations and teams and trying to understand like, how do you find good players and every team, gave us basically um, their own answer. So there was no way, uh, there was no streamlined way how esport teams really find new players. And coming from the world of traditional sports, uh, I've been playing basketball for a long time when I was younger. Uh, we know that there's a, there's a, you know, there's a system of how you activate young uh, people into getting into sports and how they get picked up by scouts and everything, but essentially nurturing uh, these young people um, at a very, very early age. Um, so we decided to talk to more organizations. We started talking to sports organizations, like how do you want to get into esports? And of course they said, yeah, it's super cool, but we don't know how. Um, so we talked to, we onboarded um, the biggest football organization, uh, soccer, that would be soccer in the US, 
organization in Europe, they have 5,000 active young players and everyone is paying a lot of money to, to play for this team. Um, so this is a massive, you know, massive organization. So we, so we got back to, to these esport organization asking them like, shouldn't you do like sport organizations for many reasons, you know, for recurring revenue streams, making money, you know, building a, a true fan uh, base and so forth, because right now we know there's a problem uh, with that. You have gamer fans, essentially team fans are, you know, not so it's not like real madrid fan if you're a real madrid fan then you you kill your brother like if he if he if he's a barcelona fan so um so what we did was essentially talking to a lot of esport teams all over the world essentially it all ended up with them saying hey we want to have our own portal okay because we understood that this is a digital sports so they need technology they need di digital technology i mean uh, and tools in, in order to become this sport organization, okay, that they want to become. Like, how are you going to handle thousands of players, okay, if you're only digital, right? It's an electronic sport. sport. So, so we, we built this uh, platform, we converted it into a white label solution. So essentially, any team around the world can now just, you know, launch their own portal and activate programs uh, that would be, you know, esport titles. We have about like 20, 25 of them on the platform and they essentially do whatever they want because we are very agnostic. We are like, we are tech heavy. We work a lot of with data. We do prediction modeling and machine learning in the background. Um, and we track everything from gaming uh, skills. We do physical tracking. We do psychological assessments. We are also integrating super cool services like uh, 3D aim trainer. So bringing all of these, you know, data sets together and really giving the power to teams and organizations because we don't know what's going to be, you know, what's the most important thing or like what kind of, like is coaching good or is, you know, mentoring or maybe you have a content library, like how are you going to do it? We don't know. We just build this platform, we give it to teams and it's going to, you know, it's, it's growing uh, organically. And we did a pilot test with an organization from Denmark and they have shown insane results. I mean, they started off as a normal, you know, esport organization. They have been around for a couple of years and they were like maybe 50 people. Um, and now they're 10,000 club members in this team. Okay. Uh, and they have about maybe 10% subscribers. So they're making more money than the biggest teams. If you look at recurring revenue streams. So, you know, subscriptions, and that's just one of the one of the angles that that made them into a big sport organization. So now they're able to handle hundreds and thousands of players and able to provide them with coaching, with library, with content, with and, and events and, and, and everything. So uh, so yeah, definitely I think that technology is uh, gonna convert esports into becoming more and more like sport organizations and with the help of data. Um, it's just going to be super cool. Uh, I'm very, you know, uh, how do you say, like, I don't know what this data is going to do. We do some prediction modeling. There are a lot of companies doing that, doing cool things for CSGO, especially we've talked to many guys for, uh, I mean, many companies that do that. Uh, but we, we don't really know, like, where is this going? And just to, you know, finish off, I just want to say that Early on in our journey, we realized that teams, you know, they're not looking for good players. They said, like, if you can find a player with 100,000 followers on Twitter, I'm going to hire him now. I don't care if his headshot accuracy is like 99%. It doesn't, because I'm not going to make money out of that. But if he has 100,000 followers, bring him to us. We're going to, you know, we're going to give him a content creator contract and that's it. But then we realized it's very different from game title to game title. So when I talk to... We had Pelle Pycat from Dota. He's a like a, one of the best players in Dota uh, before. I don't know if he's still playing, but um, he came over and he said, in Dota, there's nothing like that. In Dota, you have to just be, you know, the best player, you know, with gaming mechanics in, 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 um, at the core of everything. And also from region to region, talking to North America and Western Europe, it's going to be a lot of, yeah, we want streamers, content creators, build something like FaZe Clan, 
but if you talk more to the Middle East, Asia, you're going to see that, there, no, there's another focus because teams and organizations in the Middle East, especially we're talking to GCC region, they have a lot of money. So they, they have, you know, heavy investors. And so they're just looking to expand globally. So they have a totally different focus. Uh, so it's very, very interesting, I think that, and I, I just want to finish off with saying that um, we don't really know uh, as much as we think that we do because it's constantly changing. And I think that technology is going to change a lot in this industry going forward. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for your uh, detailed explanation about uh, everything, how esports is shaping up and of course, we all don't know that we, whether it will become a mainline sport in the coming years, but everyone is talking about the same. And we have uh, Mikhail, like who is working on a specific uh, aim training the FPS gamers. And how do you think, Mikhail, like uh, these type of technologies, uh, we are working in the esports, but focusing on a specific area in esports. Do you think it's gonna uh, these type of uh, technologies will evolve the esports in becoming a more mainline sport in the future? Uh, 100%. I mean, like I said uh, uh, before, one of the main benefits of of, of esports is that it's electronic sports, uh, and electronics means it's it's super scalable. Um, so, uh, a bit attaching to what Eric said there, uh, the fact that an organization through through well, well orchestrated platforms that are connected with multiple services that analyze different aspects of, of you as a gamer, while connecting that all in platforms makes things very scalable for organizations to do that. If you compare that, for example, to a tra through a traditional sport, it's not that scalable. Uh, you still need a coach who can at maximum maybe engage with, with 20 people at the same time and that's already definitely not uh, for for the the higher performing uh, teams where it's probably almost uh, uh, two kids and one coach one way or another that that issue that barrier which is also by the way a big barrier from a, a monetization perspective and for many kids simply not being able to pay that that's simply not there I mean it's a very scalable sport and it's all a matter of integrating the best services and combining them in order to create the best solution for the sport in general, for esports in general. Um, we acknowledge that aim training is an aspect of what it means to be to be good at, as a player. Uh, it's just one thing. And there are many other uh, aspects like good communication, uh, having a good rest, being able to follow up on uh, quite, quite often, etc. And I mean, everyone can't be an ace in everything, but the fact that it's digital allows us to integrate all these services and connect these services. And that's simply not possible when it comes to traditional sports. They all need to build this whole massive thing on their own. Uh, and, and yeah, hence not scalable or super expensive or only for the happy few. Whilst esports, I truly believe, can be there for everyone everywhere. Uh, very reasonable and probably free prices. So um, yeah, for me, we're definitely still in the catch-up phase when it comes to uh, esports versus sports, but uh, we're very close to overcoming it in every way. I mean, Daniel made a very good point that we're, in my opinion, from a fan engagement perspective, we're already ahead of sports. Um, definitely when it comes to the interactivity due to the nature, again, that it is electronic, when it comes to the the fundamentals of, on how to create a basic layer and let people evolve and grow, et cetera. There we're still playing catch up, but the fact that all these technologies are able to communicate with each other and are available for every type of organizations simply makes it almost impossible that we will not overthrow any type of traditional sports, uh, both fan engagement as education and scaling wise. Um, yeah, please. Sure, that's my I Yes, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I also feel like I think uh, it might be, it will be a more integrated approach and it cannot be just esports or just sports. I think even the sports are looking towards the esports model and even the esports is looking towards the sports model where fitness is also coming into picture. Like it's not about just gaming, but it's also about keeping the gamer mentally and physically fit when they are into esports. And yes, Anders, like what are your views into this? Uh, uh, about esports getting into the mainstream sports 
Uh, I mean, I'm always really nervous whenever that conversation comes up because, I mean, my big fear is that we we keep holding sort of traditional sports up as this sort of holy grail and everything gets everything gets sort of one-to-one -one measure. I think those measurements can sometimes make sense and other times they're just really misleading and confusing. So I'm just always very careful about whether or not I am trying to make a comparison that sort of makes sense or or not. Um, there are some, I think there are some sports models that we can learn from and, fi and sort of try to achieve in the same way. And there are some that are really tricky. I mean, I would, my understanding, I'm not an expert on this, but <clears throat> is that a sort of a normal sports club, football club, let's say, would have basically four pillars of income that they would be relying on, right? So that'd be merchandising sale, ticket sales for a stadium, it'd be media rights and sponsorships, and then maybe player sales or whatever. And if, if we're being quite honest about what those four pillars look like for an esports organization, it's practically non-existent on any level, really. Uh, and maybe that's fine. I actually think of that as exciting because I think for me that means we can shape it instead of just inheriting some other. Like if we had come up with a new physical sport uh, amongst the five or six of us here, then you know we would just inherit all of that system and we couldn't probably ever change it. Um, I think some of those things will never work on the internet and can never be done in the same fashion at all. Um, and I think, uh, not that this is only related to esports, but it's pretty obvious for anyone who's paying attention that we're facing essentially like something like a payment and micropayment revolution when it comes to cryptocurrencies. And what that will do to our space, because obviously the big problem that we're really facing is that it makes sense to sell a football player for 100 million euros because you know you're probably going to be making 95 million euros in merchandising sales. I think, Eric, that's what you were alluding to, right? You know that if your football team buys Messi or whatever, then you're going to be making that up in, in T-shirt sales and immediately and all the rest of it, right? So, so that's fine. The same is not true for an esports organization. And I think on the one hand, we have a powerful demographic of you know young people that usually have quite a bit of extra money to spend, and that's amazing. That's why many people are interested in the space. But the other problem is, you know, how do you get them to engage with something? I mean, we're all trying, all of us here, are trying to make products in some way that that will, let's say, come up with like a really good value proposition that people are interested in it. But once you get the crypto thing flashed on top of it, then all of those things become much easier, right? Whether it's on Twitch, uh, people watching live, what, what Daniel's doing, it doesn't really matter. Like it's gonna, it's gonna probably change almost everything. So I, uh, I for the last maybe I think since around 2016, 15 was when I first heard people talking about these four sports pillar, and they were sort of saying we're gonna do the same only in esports. And around 2018 was when I started getting really bored of listening to that story because I just, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to try and build it. I don't, again, I don't mind if someone says we have an incredible road to, to make, to getting sponsorships to pay 10x what they do now. I think that's totally possible. Uh, and I applaud anyone who's taking on that fight. It's super necessary. But the idea of building them one to one, I just, I don't think is, is necessarily the same thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think once we get through that thing, which I think is like an internet revolution within the internet revolution, uh, I think esports will blow up in a way that's, you know, like it will be some sort of nonlinear explosion that's going to happen after that. Um, again, partly because of the payment aspects of it. So I think I don't mind doing the esports to sports comparison, but I try and be really, really careful when I do it so that I don't uh just assume that because something it worked in sports that it will definitely also work in esports um so i hope that clarifies some of it sure uh, and, this, uh, and that definitely like when it comes to monetization and when it comes to uh merchandise sales i think sports is still a uh, way ahead on when it compared to esports and we have seen it uh, as a trend uh, in the past years uh, still, the esports personalities have to be like the favorite of a lot of gamers for them to be a regular buyer of their merchandise. Uh, what about you, Lance? Like, what do you think? What are your views about esports and sports? And how do you think uh, it's different in when you in, in your point of view? I think that everyone here has made amazing points that reflect a lot of what is the feeling among gamers, among sports organizations, and among larger international uh, officials that are working to try and understand the space more. You know, I come from a space where in 2005, you know, my family, we had made a, a multi-land gaming center, center 10,000 square feet, 128 gaming PCs, holding LAN parties with 2,000 people. This is in 2005. 
you know, um, and running land tournaments and really working with the FGC community back then, all the way to where you see now um, licenses going out, franchise systems starting up. Um, and at the same time, I was playing sports and again, got to a four year university to go and play at the highest, at the second to the highest level, um, obviously not making it to the pros. But what I learned in that process is the entire structure of what is sport. Um, I've worked very closely with the Association of National Olympic Committees, which is the union of 206 um, national countries and their NOCs. And this topic has grown and I've seen firsthand of I, as I have pitched, including gaming and esports into some form of larger international gaming venue. And you've seen these different players really uh, come inside. So there's a few points I like to make, you know, um, Esports became a billion dollar industry based off of the people that were gamers that were passionate about what they're doing and they grew their industry to what it is today. Everything that we see since then, since that valuation has come, is just an enhancement of everything that they've laid the groundwork for. So you can never forget about those people that have trailblazed the industry to be even possible in the first place. You know, secondarily, um, esports is already a sport. There's no question about it. You have chess, which is a mental game, which is considered a sport. You have different forms of sim racing, which is using your hands and feet and also your mental cap uh, capabilities in order to perform an action that is simulated to actual sport, all the way to a, a platform like Zwift, where you're actually cycling um, and doing the sport in a virtual setting, but still competing against people from around the world. The third point is also that esports breaks borders while you're sitting at home. You have to stage in typical sporting terms, a, a large international event with qualifiers that run all across the world that bring people to one stadium in one location. And that costs millions of dollars and huge expenses across the board. In esports and gaming, you can go and do that same type of event with that same type of scale and potentially viewership for one sixtieth of the cost. And that presents so many opportunities for international federations, international sports to realize the potential of gaming on a more global and broader scale. Um, so those are the kind of the first three points that we have to understand as a groundwork. And then we can go to, well, where does technology help in? Where, where do we understand what is the difference between e-sport and sport? You know, you have companies that is like a, um, like a phase clan, which is more of a content creator promoting the entertainment side. You have publishers, which understand that they can go and develop a game or they can go and put a prize pool up and use it as marketing for an esports activity and give a flourishing nature to a large community to go and band together and really support their game title and increase the longevity of their game title. Um, so there's many different aspects of which esports can kind of be used as a way to promote um, a game title, a community or different groups of people together. Um, I like to say that also that esports is about 85% similar to traditional sports. Obviously the revenue streams are a lot different and I've spoken in, in my personal experience with many owners of you know, NBA, NFL teams that have entered into investment funds and investment groups with esports organizations. And you know they all come back with the same thing that I'm this big bad marketing guru, I know how to promote sport, but esports is different. And that's exactly what they need to know is that esports is different. And they need to really listen to the community that rewards organizations, rewards game titles, rewards those involved that give the community great content, great information, and are being as transparent as possible to make sure that they're really promoting everything that everyone wants, um, which is just that people want to have fun and they want a game. That's the main thing that people want to do. And um, as, as long as we have that kind of as our North Star, I think that the gaming industry will continue to grow and especially the esports industry will continue to grow uh, massively as we've already seen. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Uh, I think uh, we all have a very different perspective about esports and the sports. And when we're talking about the new gen and when we're talking about the uh, previous gen, I mean, there's a huge opinions. Uh, there are there's a huge difference in opinions as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, great uh, conversation, great points by you, Lance, on esports. So uh, the last question for the panel will be, uh, how do you think the brands and the sponsors are embracing these new technologies? And do you think that a brand and a sponsor is paying an extra buck uh, or is paying extra for, the, for these new technologies if you're embracing in the, in the tournaments or if you're embracing them in a live event? So uh, how do you, uh, because you all are uh, here with, uh, with some different technologies. So how, how do you think that uh, and any brand in specific, if you want to just highlight, you can do that as well, are utilizing these technologies and making a difference for their uh, base of uh, audience? Uh, Anders? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I mean, so we work with a with really a bunch of different brands. I think we most we're now working with most of the top teams in Counter Strike. So that is like you know Liquid and Dignitas and and NIP and all these different organizations. Uh, we're also working with the tournament organizers that exist over here a lot with ESL with Blast as well. Um, have some conversation with WePlay. I mean, from the ESL side, for instance, they use Skybox um, to do live analytics throughout the broadcast, um, something that previously was mostly tied to sort of doing after a game was over. You could sit down and you could review things and try to figure them out. Um, but we can do that live. Uh, so, so that in itself actually gives you a whole new piece of, let's call it advertising real estate. If you're a tournament organizer, that means suddenly you can have a piece of analytics that wasn't possible before. Uh, sales and marketing team can go out and sell that to someone. That's kind of how we are trying to, that's our value proposition, or at least part of it to a platform like ESL is to say, yeah. uh, well, you already have the sales team. They already have packages that they're selling to diff to their sponsors why not give you more and then okay. we can figure out a we can figure out a way way to share that revenue um so i would say i would say so far our success on that front has been really really exciting and it's really cool to see and it's something that we're really just starting on like our, our base approach i guess it's not really that revolutionary but but it's just basically we we want to want to be able to show up to people and give them our platform and then for them to say, oh, great, we can make more money using this. Well, then it's kind of an easy choice, right? Um, and so far, so good. So that's kind yeah. of our approach. That's good. Uh, how about you, Eric? Uh, I mean, I want you to just give me like a quick, quick one with any of the brands which you're working with. Or do you think the technology embraced by any of the brands which you're working in? I I yeah, sorry. I, th I think a lot of uh, tech companies are doing really cool stuff uh, with brands uh, and especially game developers are now, um, you know, getting into that also. Uh, we don't work uh, directly with brands um, except for, you know, um, teams, especially. I mean, um, like esport teams, sport teams, uh, we talk to schools, federations, anyone really that wants to start a, some kind of a team, essentially. So, um, yeah, but I think that uh, brands are realizing that there's a lot uh, more they can do and, uh, and, and it's going to get insane in the, in the near future. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Daniel? How do you think? Uh, when it comes to brands that we work with at Streamcards, we're obviously looking for new partnerships with broadcasters. Um, and their brands, their partners that are looking to either enter esports or explore new partnerships, um, or bring new ones to a completely new level. Um, our product can help with that, um, with user acquisition and reach. Uh, having said that, you know we're currently in advanced discussions with some of the largest broadcasters globally uh, in CSGO. And uh, yeah, we definitely look forward to sharing some really huge news soon. Uh, uh, our product still is in closed beta. Um, but our focus predominantly is for, with with esports broadcasters. Okay, uh, I think uh, great answers, and uh, we definitely this was this would be motivating for the new frontiers in technology who are building up because you can see a potential of brands investing into these new technologies in their existing ecosystem or maybe uh, working something really new, cool stuff with the. Uh, New frontiers. So we move on to our question and answer round. So we have a question uh, that do you think that athlete training is as important as technology in affecting gamer performance? So who who's gonna take this? <laughs> Mikhail, Lance. Uh, it's more about yeah, sure. I, can just, I can just. I can just. Sorry. <laughs> I can just tell you that um, it's going to be more and more of this. Of course, we see new companies coming in to esports, uh, focusing on physicals, uh, and um, there are some preliminary research being done right now uh, that proves that if, if you know physically active people um, will have a better mental health and essentially being better at gaming and focus and, and especially when it comes to the stuff that Mikel is doing, the speed of reaction and everything. I mean, it goes hand in hand, right? So you have to sleep well, you have to eat well, you have to train in order to have that sharp focus, and, you know, be quick and also, yeah, make quick decisions. Yeah, I think uh, just adding to that, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. 
we can you can well, go ahead and then Anders. <laughs> oh sure Ad adding to that i think i mean um the question uh, as i understood it correctly is um the thing that athlete training is as important as technology and affecting gaming performance uh, and, uh for me, they just go hand in hand. Um, I mean, athlete training is uh, affected by by the technology. Um, the the better kind of services we can develop through technology, the better we will be able to develop athletes. Or, I mean, athletes sure that's like the top zero point zero one percent, but everyone else below that that just enjoys playing that sport, uh, that just enjoys playing a certain game. So for me, they just go hand in hand. Um, I see um, a platform like like 3D Aim Trainer. I see it uh, in comparison to to the goal, uh, basically on, on a pitch field. I mean, it's just uh, a crucial part of you developing yourself as 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 a gamer, as someone who enjoys playing this game. So it's it's for me not two different things. It's one and the same. And I think there again, making the comparison, even though some aren't that. A fan of it, but I think there that's where esports has simply the edge over uh, traditional sports because uh, it, it's more measurable, more scalable, and and it it is well um, created with technology in mind. Basically, it's a technology on its own. So yeah, that's my my two cents on it. Anders, well, just real quick. I mean, I think it also it helps us to avoid. Uh, let's call it liability for lack of a better word, but there, there is this you know, stigma that I don't think we're fighting nearly as much anymore as we were 10 years ago, but it's still, I think it's it's better to catch it before people start to point the finger and say, well, hold on, is this actually a, he a healthy thing to engage in? Uh, you know, isn't it bad to play video games this many hours a day? Why not just counter that right away? Same if you want to convince parents or anyone else that, that their kids, you know, should pursue a career in esports. Um, I just think there's no reason not to get out ahead of that, um, even if you just look at it from that point of view. So, yeah, but I do think it will if affect performance. Um, I mean, I agree. Uh, the studies always need to be done and people are doing them. So that's great. But I think just logically it makes sense. Thanks, Anders. So moving on to the next question, uh, how do you imagine the gaming industry will have evolved 10 years from now? What about 50 years from now? So <laughs> I think we have a very creative person from the audience who is who wants us to imagine 50 years from now. So what are your views like? I mean, how it has evolved? Of course, we are seeing it, but uh, please uh, <laughs> give us. <laughs> and I, what I do you think love. 50? Yeah. I, I would love to tap into this one. I mean, um, you know, this is probably one of the best things that have gone on in Clubhouse in terms of ideation. And we've been lucky, at least over here stateside, to have some of the biggest uh, executives in gaming join Clubhouse conversations exactly talking about this. One uh, note that I take from one of these conversations was Strauss, Strauss Stelenik from uh, Take-Two Interactive, who said something of the nature that 82% of uh, what he learned at Warner, Warner Brothers was that when they were doing their data on movies that they were producing and trying to get new audiences to join onto different fandoms and series is that they found that 17 year olds, about 82% of them by the age of 17 would already confirm and know what type of medium of entertainment they liked. Um, why that's important is that when you look at people who are starting to have kids now and even folks who have grown up with gaming um, already, they're watching Twitch streams. They're having it run in the background. They're having gaming going on in some form or another, whether it's on YouTube. They're consuming that in, that that uh, that entertainment at a higher scale, and those families are going to have their kids adopt that entertainment medium uh, sooner than those prior. So we will continue to see a one x, two x, three x of the amount of gaming fans that are already in existence right now. And that's not even talking about all the different technologies when we go to you know, blockchain technology, the, the increasing uh, capabilities of internet technology and uh, more capabilities of Wi-Fi and satellite internet um, across the globe. I mean, you're talking about an entire metaverse sphere that's gonna come up. You're talking about the gaming industry potentially changing to a play to game where you actually start earning money from the economies inside the games. Um, these are gonna open up different revenue streams for people that consume these content and games, as well as you know have some conflicts that can arise from that. Um, when we talk about addiction and, and having to actually go to work and setting limitations for what, if there is play the game, what those work schedules would be. Um, so the gaming industry is definitely a strong one that relies on technology at its core to expand, but it is expanding and it will need some policy to come in at certain points in time to help 
uh, foster that growth. Vendors, what are your views? It's an incredible layout. Uh, Lance, I appreciate it. Uh, you, you touched all the points nearly that I wanted to touch on. But, yeah, you know, the the whole the whole play the game thing, like you said, it, in itself is is already like you know mildly underway. I'm sure you know that, but uh, yeah, it, that's so interesting to think about. Uh, and then you know, if you add into this the VR space, that is still just people are just like sort of thinking about it a little bit. Um, on top, I mean, right now, obviously, the price of a VR headset and the hardware that you need is just super high, but we all know eventually that's going to come down and down and down. And what that will do, I think, first of all, to allowing esports that the card really even exists today is in itself fun to think about. If you stretch it, like the question asked, all the way into 50 years into the future, I actually slightly wonder if we'll see some sort of bizarre inversion into what it means to go to a live esports event. Because right now we can put 10,000 people in a stadium but if you have a million people online that could watch with a VR headset and their experience can essentially be, it can be just as real as being in the stadium, only they can take all the headsets and go get snacks in the kitchen and they can come back. Then I wonder if at some point you don't just start giving away the tickets to the arena for free because you just need those people there for the experience for the home fans. Um, and then you can sell a million online tickets, which is obviously, you know, I mean, if you just keep the ticket price the same, even if you put it at half, it doesn't really matter. You're still sell way out selling your physical audience. So I imagine if you stretch it, 50 years is a long time. I can't see that far into the future. Um, but I just, I imagine we're going to see some really funky things. And then, the, the NFT and crypto space, I still think will complete, will be a hurricane through the system. That's going to be, leave everyone wondering what the hell happened. So that'll be fun. Daniel. Um, you know, I think like, if you look at gaming in itself, uh, I come from a loyalty background. So I've worked with large loyalty programs here in Europe. And for me, being able to earn loyalty points, for example, by defeating a raid boss in World of Warcraft will give you enough points that you can go to, say, a grocery store and be able to get a Kit Kat. Um, because so far, this relationship exists only in one direction, where if you make uh, shopping, if you shop in the real world, you'll be able to amass points, which you can then redeem for vouchers to your Google store, App Store, Steam, Steam vouchers, and so on. However, I think that in the future, we're definitely going to see this merger between the two worlds, where if you achieve um, certain goals within a game, uh, obviously increasing your play time, potentially some sort of subscription service, if, if, it's an MMO, if MMOs will still exist. Um, that's something which I feel is going to be uh, more prominent because we're already seeing that loyalty programs are looking at entering the gaming space. Um, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a beautiful marriage. Sure. So moving on to my next question from the audience is that, what advice might you give to an investor who is bullish on esports? What is the best way for them to invest their money? Um, we have less time, so I want someone to very quick on this question. <laughs> Can I, I can Eric? give it a quick go. I think, yeah. uh, I think uh, depends on how risky you want to take it, obviously, but uh, but I mean, investing in in the foundations, uh, I believe, is super important. And I I was skimming through the panel in my head, and and each of us um, uh, takes a different piece of that foundation. Where um, Eric and and myself, with our companies, are more in the educational part, and then Daniel is in the more in the fan engagement part. Uh, where Anders is in the analytics and fan engagement part. Um, I, I mean, so so look at the chain and look at what the key pillars are uh, and if you have companies doing something revolutionary or really already being like um, a strong pillar in in those foundations well that, that's probably a good bet basically because you i mean you can't go wrong there um uh, so yeah okay that, that yeah to add to yeah, Michael, I... um, whoever asked that question i would suggest just invest in all of our startups absolutely <laughs> fine with us <laughs> and uh, this question is for Mikhail. Like, besides FPS and 3D aim, what are some other gaming skills that are being or could be improved with similar training applications? Oh, that's, I that's, have that's, a few more questions, so you have to be quick. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, uh, there are, are many things basically that that we can improve. I mean we mentioned already like uh, physical fitness be being super important and being super tied to it. But um, when it comes to 
to aiming and gaming, it's more than just mouse reflexes, etc. It's all about training your brain in the end uh, in order to yeah, be able to pick up on things faster as well. So there are companies working purely only on, on reading your brain activity while gaming, etc. So I mean, there are, uh, yeah, in many, many different ways, uh, uh, people can uh, improve themselves, um, um, yeah, outside of yeah. just simple aiming. Okay, moving on to my next question. How much growth do you predict in technologies that allows at home viewers, fans to be more active participants in the stream and event? So how much growth are you predicting in this technology, Anders? Um, it's obviously hard to put your specific numbers on, but I would, again, I think we're talking about non-linear growth, basically. Um, again, the, the actual esports audience is the, mm -hmm. is the real untapped market right now because they pay for the games, which means the publishers make a lot of money, and then they don't pay for much else really. And I don't think that's because it's impossible to make them. So I just think the, the current offers that are out there, uh, I mean, they pay for streamers too, right? They subscribe to, to famous streamers they like. Um, but I think, I think generally speaking, it's not that people don't have the money or that the culture makes it impossible to make people pay for things. That's, I think, been proven not true in many different ways. I just think it's a question that uh, once the right offers are out there, um, the, the audiences will, will be there. I mean, the audience is big enough. Um, as soon as you can unlock that potential, uh, it's, it's going to be yeah, non-linear non growth, basically. Thank you, Anders. Uh, I think with this, so we will we have come towards the end of this uh, exciting panel discussion. Just if you want to end up with the last point about uh, about this whole discussion, I want everyone to just add in one last uh, view or a point to end this whole discussion. Uh, Lance, you want to go ahead? You know, I would say to anyone looking at esports who's already involved in esports really prioritize localization. Localization is everything and make sure that you're delivering to people in the community, promoting the community and making sure that they understand that they're one of the most important pillars of what is the gaming community. Um, I think that that's the one thing I would love people to know. Great point. Uh, Eric? Mm, yeah, Eric? no, um, uh, I have a similar um, comment as Lance, uh, focus on the young players. I have four kids myself. So uh, it's pretty busy at home uh, and they're all gaming, of course, um, like everyone else. And uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, my youngest kids, they're going to grow up into a world where instead of playing basketball as I did, they're going to play some, you know, esport probably. Uh, and, and yeah, they need focus. They need nurturing. They need frameworks. They need support. They need, you know, all of that things that I didn't have when I was playing Super Mario for hours and hours. Yeah. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I mean, um, I think again, what 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 this panel and the people that are here are, and the questions that we're getting clearly state is that I mean, we're we're still early stage, and and a lot of what what is uh what we would like to know, we simply don't know yet. Uh, but I do think that we're building something, all of us together, every company I speak to on a daily basis are building something that is bigger than, than anything simply that we've seen before. So whatever you're imagining right now, a bit relating to the 50 years from now question, well, you're wrong basically. Uh, and that's what makes this uh, the most incredible space to operate in, period. I mean, uh, the future is, is uh, unimaginable at this stage and yeah. Daniel. And these opportunities. Thanks, Mikhail. Daniel? Um, yeah, I think Mikhail raised a point. You know, everyone's building a pretty unique technology here. And I think it's up to the existing ecosystem to be able to embrace that change and incorporate that change into their strategy. You know, one of the risks that I see is oftentimes, like we touched upon it during this panel as well, is that you know, we made comparisons between sports and esports, but if we 
you know, constrict ourselves to thinking about the sort of traditional sports framework in itself, we might forego certain opportunities that are available today in esports for growing this industry and developing new uh, features, for example, within the space of fan engagement. So uh, I think it's really important just to be able to have an open mind and talk with, with different, with different uh, stakeholders and see how we can actually drive value uh, by reaching mutual goals together. Sure. Anders? Wow, a lot of good points. Uh, I guess I should also just finally say I'm really glad I could make it here. Um, glad you have me and everything else. Um, I, I, I think uh, what uh, what Miguel was saying is is definitely something that you know sometimes things are framed as being problem. Like, what are the problems in esports? How do we overcome this problem? I'm a little bit of the same mindset. I feel like the the fun thing is that we actually can change things and that the road ahead isn't really paved in the same way. Um, I think that's amazing. We have, uh, we talked a little bit about education and universities earlier. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing probably all over the place are existing degrees with an esports bend, right? So you'll have like, you know, esports law pop up or esports economics or esports advertising, like everything can have an esports thing. I'm sure you can have like esports medicine at some point too. Um, and it just becomes, it just becomes this amazing space where, you know, like we can, we can sort of decide what kind of people we need. Um, and a lot of the most, as far as I can tell, most creative young people out there are like, they want that because it's part of their hobby, right? So it's, it's becoming this, gravity well of sucking in really creative, really interesting people. Uh, and again, we are, I completely agree, we are really just getting started, but um, that's an amazing foundation already. I'm sure the West will, you know, will, will be built by all of us here and many more people too. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think uh, we have some great points and great discussion here. And uh, a goodbye from this panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a great one, everybody. Yes. You too.